coming. My name is Braulio, and I work for AgBlue Technical Services. I would like to start with a question. How many of you have used AgBlue to make a donation? Wow, quite a few. How many of you tipped? <laughs> Not so many, but for the ones who tip, thank you. <laughs> I stole the title for the presentation from Bernie Sanders. He was saying that we need a political revolution. Uh, but Sanders made small dollar donations popular, but he's only one of the more than 17,000 organizations that have been using the service for the last 13 years. And it's not only political, we, we also provide the service for nonprofits. In fact, Agblue is a nonprofit. Um, in the first quarter of this year alone, we, we, are, we, are, uh, we have 3,000 organizations using the platform. And our Rails application ha uh, is 12 years old. So how does it work? Let's say that Jason in the back, who works here, he wants to run for city council. And I'm sure he would be a good city council, but he needs money to promote his campaign. Um, so how he would like to, to get donations. Of course, he cannot um, process credit cards by himself. So what he will do is he will go to Agblue, will set up a page, and from that point, we'll process the credit cards using that page. Once a week, he will get a check. And we also will take care of the legal part, which is very complicated, and we'll also do the compliance. There are multiple reports that have to be sent when you are doing political fundraising or for nonprofits. Um, so we also provide uh, additional tools for the campaigns, statistics, A-B tests. We have uh, a, someone who donates can also save the card information in the website. And the next time they donate to that, to the same organization or a different one, they don't have to enter anything. It, it will be a one click, a single click donation. We have 3.8 million people uh, with Agbook Express users. So far we have raised $1.6 billion in 31 million contributions in these 13 years. And we like to see ourselves as empowering small dollar donors. Uh, how many of you don't know what Citizens United is? Ah, oh, all of you know. Okay. Well, in case you know, in case someone, someone doesn't know, I didn't raise uh, their hand, is Citizens United is a ruling by the Supreme Court and it allows a limited amount of, um, amount of money to promote a political candidate. So a few, few people with lots of money will have a lot of power in the political process. In the political side, we also do nonprofits. But in the political side, this is how we started. We, like to, we would like to have lots of, small, lots of small dollars, which means a lot of people with little money having the same power. This is how the contribution page looks. This is for John Ossoff. The, 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 the person here has never visited the website before. It will be a multi-step process. It's getting the amount first, then we will, the next step will get the name, address, credit card, et cetera. This is, an, this is a non-profit, by the way. Um, in this case, there, it, it is an express user donor. It says, hi, Braulio, so it recognizes that it's, it's me. And if I click any of those buttons, the, the donation will process right away. I don't have to enter a card number. That's what we call the single click. Um, during, the, during February of last year, Bernie won the primaries in New Hampshire. That was the second state with primary elections, and he won big. It was after Iowa. And he gave a his, his, uh, victory speech that night, and I'm, I'm going to show a little clip from, from there. To hold a fundraiser right here, right now, across America. My request is, please go to berniesanders.com and contribute.
Right away, we felt the burn. <laughs> so the, the first one is requests per minute is about 330,000 per minute. And the second one is contributions, uh, credit card payments. 27,000 per minute, it's about 40 per second. Uh, that's a lot because a credit card payment, you'll see it's, it's expensive to, to do. And the, the reason why I show these graphs is to stress the fact that improving performance is a continuous process. It, it's not something that happens from one day to the next. It, we were able to handle this, this spike pretty well. Some um, donors didn't see the thank you page. They, they only saw the spinner. And after donating, they never got to the next page. But we never stopped receiving contributions. And you can see that there is no gap. So the service was never down. And that's, that's because we were doing all these 13 years. Every time we have high traffic, for any reason, we have been analyzing why do we have that? Is there a bottleneck? bottleneck? Can we improve it? So this, this presentation is about all the experience we have gathered during all these years. The first thing we have to do is define what we're going to optimize. And that will depend on the business. In every case, it will be different. For an e-commerce website, for example, it's very likely that it will be uh, the response time on browsing the catalog. In our case, in our case it's pretty simple. It's a contribution form. And we have to optimize two things. One is how we load it. And the other one is how we process. Loading contribution, the contribution form has no secret. is what you think of loading a form. It's very simple. But processing is a little different. In the center, I have our servers. And around that, I have all the, those, those are web service calls that I have to do in order to execute a payment. Uh, we have a vault for the credit card numbers. And outside, that all the, the vault is the only place where we have the numbers. Outside of that is all tokens. So the first thing we have to do is we have to get a token. We have to tokenize the card. That's number one. That's a post and a response. Then I have a fraud score. I, I have external service will, which will provide that, uh, that service for me. Then I have, with the bank, I actually have two. The first step, when you, all the credit cards are processed this way, you first make what is called an authorization, which is a post, again. From the bank will respond whether it's approved. In that case, it will give me an authorization number or it will say decline. But there is no money transferred at that point. I have to do a second step, another post, and send the number I got, uh, if it was approved, of course, and the bank will respond with a confirmation. Also, I have a, an email receipt I want to send, and every, every organization wants to know, or most of the organizations want to know right away when they get a contribution. So they want also uh, to be informed. Uh, the thing looks like this. Do you remember those? How many can you do in a minute? <laughs> it's too many young people here that you, you, haven't not, you have never seen this. No? Only the old people can, <laughs> can remember. OK. So we have a, this is a high volume track. We have, because we have so many donations, we have a scaling challenge. We have to be able to process this fast and efficiently. Uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to present one approach. I will show several. So for each one, I will explain how it works, how it is implemented, uh, maybe some code. And there, is, there will always be a cost. And we'll, we'll give a how to solve it. The first one, metrics. Um, here is the part I'm not, do, can you see the graphs or no? I, I thought if that would, was going to be the case. How about that? Well, we have dozens of this. I'm going to show only a few, the most important ones. This is contributions per minute. On the X axis is the time, on the Y is the number. And something happened there. Actually, that what happened there was a Bernie one in Indiana and there was a spike. We, this we called Bernie moments, by the way. 
<laughs> so um, that one. Now I have another one here, which is traffic. It will be it will be correlated. By the way, correlating when you have metrics when you have metrics numbers are not enough. You need graphs like this, and and if you have graphs, you can correlate and between traffic and contributions, there is a correlation. But this one is the number of contributions that are being processed, because we have so many web services we have to touch. There will be a certain number that will be always in part of that process. So I'm counting those. And if you see, between these two, the contributions and the pending there is no correlation, which is great. That's how it should be. If for some reason pending was also going up in the same way contributions are going up, it means the service is saturated. I cannot process as fast I as receive them. In this case, it's wonderful. This, that, that's how it should be always. And sometimes it wasn't, but that's the goal. Then the last one is that one is latency. That is a time interval. It is how long it takes between the I create a contribution and I receive an authorization from the bank. That's also an important number. In this case, it's about two to three minutes, uh, seconds. This is how I do metrics in Ruby. There is a gem called statsd Ruby. I call the class statsd, I create a new object, I pass the host, the host name, I will have multiple hosts, so I need to know where this is happening. The second instruction is a gauge, and the gauge will draw, it will generate, excuse me, it will not draw, it will generate a data point, which is an integer. In this case, how many pending authorizations I have. And the timing method, both gauge and timing are sidekick excuse me, our stats D methods. I have a time interval, which I, as, as I mentioned before, the distance between when it was created to when it was approved. Very simple. But if you have lots of this, you will be able to have those graphs. And the way you render the graphs is with something called graphite. The, you will have Postgres, Posse, you will have all sorts of things. You also want to measure, you want to measure CPU, memory, disk. So there is something called collect D that will have, will have plugins to, to gather that information easily. I mentioned logs. It, don't, they are not really metrics, but they are very important. Don't forget them. Good. We, we covered the first one. Um, now, multiple servers. Multiple servers is, it doesn't, if you start with one, with one host, which is normally the case, uh, even the fastest computer in the world won't be able to handle all the load. You will have to put a second, a third, et cetera. So this graph shows on the right, I have three machines running. Inside each machine, I have a little circle. Th those are representing threads. So I can have a web server running in each thread. I have multi-threading, which is simple. But the important part here is I have different computers. And because I have that, I, have that, I need to have this piece in the middle, which is a load balancer. The load balancer can be a piece of software or hardware. Well, in the end, anything is software, but don't get too technical with me. Uh, the, uh, the browser will, the DNS will resolve into the IP address of the load balancer. The request will get there. The load balancer will pick one host, and it will pass that request. How you implement will depend on the hosting company. Uh, I have here uh, this is called the poor man's version of uh, load balancer because it's free. It, 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 it is doing Nginx. I can configure Nginx to do load balancing, and I see two blocks. Can you see well? Yeah. The, the first block it defines the IP addresses of the three hosts. And the second block, the server block, is telling me that I will be listening on port 80, and all the requests should be passed to the backend block. There is an algorithm that will define how they are picked, but in this case, it's whatever, sequential, random, round robin, it doesn't matter. You can define it if you want. So there are costs involved when you are doing this. The first one, if you have used Heroku, 
the first surprise when you start with Heroku is there is no file system. And this is why. You upload, uh, in the browser, you upload the file. It will be on one host. Later, there will be a different request on a different computer. And that will, you, you will try to see the file on that computer, but it's not there. So you need to provide a mechanism to fix that. One way is use Amazon Web Services S3, which is uh, a memory, it basically is disk. Or another option is something called sticky sessions, which is the load balancer can pick always the same host and send th those requests there. But that, that's for the second, uh, for the second problem, but <laughs> I got a little ahead. Uh, I'm talking about persistence. You can replicate the files, you can do that. With persistence, I don't share the memory, and uh, I can have the sticky sessions I was talking about, but Rails is very good. You have out of the box Rails sessions. That's how you share state. You can also use Redis if you want your own um, a data store. The third problem you're going to have is you will have, because you're having more servers running, all of them connected to the same database, you're going to start running out of connections. The database has a limit on how many you can connect. The, what we do is in post, Postgres, you can easily define a replication. That means there will be copies of the database. That we will be, the data on those database will be a little behind, but not too much. They're read-only, but I can still use them. And if there is a host that doesn't need read-write access, that one doesn't have to connect to the main database. It will connect to that one, to the replica. Um, the last one is, it doesn't matter if if all the servers are, all the hosts are up, doesn't matter how many I have, if the load balancer is down, I have a problem. And in our case, the solution is a combination between our CDN, I will explain what the CDN is, but it's a combination between the CDN and the load balancer provided by the hosting company. Good, we did two. We have next one, caching. Caching is the most popular one. Uh, every time you hear about performance, you will hear, hey, you have to do caching, and caching is basic, basically making a copy, keeping a copy somewhere to save time. You will have caching between, there is a cache in the browser, in the browser and there is a cache in the web server, and, the, and there will be caches in between as well. And uh, if you have, if you have money, it, you can hire a caching service and have something up and running very quickly. That's why I say high is viable for the effort. We, we use something called Fastly, which is a content delivery network. The, there are several, Akamai is another one very popular, Cloudflare, and I will explain how it works uh, in the next slide. But this is very good. This is something that works very well. And the, the loading part of the form is the part that gets all the benefit of doing this. And we, we one time had a denial, been distributed denial of service attack. And we handled very well only because the, the CDN was there for us. We couldn't have handled that with our own servers. This is how it works. I have a browser in Boston. Um, and uh, the boxes on the right are POP's point of presence that belongs to the CD and it doesn't belong to ActBlue. I have a POP in New England. So the browser in Boston will make it, if you follow the numbers, you will, be, uh, you will follow the sequence. We'll get a get request, the, because this is the first time I request this document, the POP will make another get to uh, our own server, the ActBlue host, to get the document, we will respond, that's number three. Uh, we're adding two headers there. We'll explain what it is. And the pop will the, in, in, in time respond to the, to the browser with the document. Um, there is another header in the last response. Now, later, there is, uh, in Providence is a city near 100 miles from Boston. So that city will also go to the same pop who will make a get, but because the pop has the copy, it won't request the copy from us. So we are not going to see the second get. Uh, the pop will respond with the copy they have. The, um, 
And there will be other pops. The pops are distributed all over the world. And uh, for example, in this case, I'm putting one in the West Coast. So if someone in LA is browsing ActBlue, they will go there. And they will have their own copy. This is a map where the red dots represent pop pops. This is a dash dashboard for Fastly. And the size represents how many hits I have. Hit, it means that I have the copy. Uh, it's a cache hit. And the bigger, the biggest are in the US, but there are also uh, red dots in Europe, Asia, Australia. The gauge on the left indicates that there is a 97% uh, hit rate. And what that means is only 3% of the requests will get to my servers. 97% of all the requests that the, the CDN is receiving, all the, you have to keep in mind that all, all the requests go to the CDN first. 97% of them will stay there and it will never touch my, my, my web server, which is great. How do you control cache? You need to control two things. You need to control how long the copy will live in the, in the cache and how you do the purge. Purge means you force a refresh. You, you specify how long it will live in the copy, but sometimes you want to do it right away. You don't want to wait all the, all the time. So do you do this with headers? I'm showing a few here. Cache control is the first one, which is the most popular one. It tells me, max H400, it tells me, that, tells me that I will put the slides on, online. By the way, you don't have to worry about it. The 400 seconds, every, in any place, it means that in the browser it will live 400 seconds or in between, or in the CDN as well. Surrogate control is longer, 3,600 seconds, and that one is the same as cache, cache control, but it's only for the CDN. There is a specific a specific, a specific specification um, for how CDNs work. It's called edge architecture. And that's, that's where this header is defined. Vary another one, surrogate key. I can, for each document, I can define that there is like a tag, which is great because at some point I might say, hey, I want to force a refresh on, on all these pages. If all the pages have tag key two, I can do it in a single call. There is another thing called varnish configuration language, which is a script. The script has access to all the, re the request and the, the, the whole request and also the, the, um, the URL. I, I want to show something. The, the, the VCL, the script will run in the place where the pop is getting the request from the browser and it will also run in the part where it's getting the response from the host. And this is an example of what can I do when it, with the VCL. I can check the URL, and in this case, it starts with videos. In that case, I say, hey, I, I would like to use a specific backend for videos, and that's the name of the backend, FVideo LB, it's a load balancer. And I don't want to, this is what I'm, I'm trying to avoid, I don't want to mix videos and the contribution. I can also respond right away. I can say, hey, return 400, for example, without touching the server. There is also an API. Uh, the, with the API, you can purge keys, one or uh, all of them. The cost is very expensive. Um, if you want fine, control on, on how, how the, the, the copies are kept and, and uh, purged, it will get complicated. Uh, second, the third, if you are doing SSL, in our case, we always do SSL. It's complicated because all the pops will need to have a copy of the certificate and also the private keys. I need to maintain that. Uh, the other thing is, if you remember from the slide what slide is five? Yes. It says high Braulio. I can bet that checkout pages in regular websites are not cached because you have this personalization. If you cache this and my neighbor is seeing high Braulio, it doesn't work. Um, so 
I need to handle that. And the way we do it, in, in our case, we cannot follow that approach. We have to cache because it's the most important form. So we have JavaScript. We, we cache everything except those little pieces, and they are filled with JavaScript. Great, we have quarter three. How are we doing in time? Um, separation of concerns, also known as SOA or microservices. It's a very simple idea. I will have different applications to handle different parts of the system. The, the, the first example here is the tokenizer, the vault, which is an application written in Node, completely separate. It's even in a different hosting company. I can have also multiple copies of the database that way. And uh, one of the advantages of having separation of concerns is for compliance. The, the fact that we have this vault means that if I don't have access, I don't need to comply. I don't need to have an antivirus on my, on my laptop. So that's why I have never seen a credit card number because I don't want to have a, an antivirus on my laptop. The cost, as anyone who has done microservices of SOA, is the fact that it's very difficult to implement and very difficult to test. Um, great, one, two, three, four. We have cover four. We are now going to cover now different tasks. Uh, in our case, we'll, we are, we're going to talk about tasks that are slow. So. Uh, I don't want the web server to be doing something that's slow because it will hold it for a long time and that server will, won't be able to handle other, other requests. It means I need to, uh, if for example, in this is slide number nine, and all of these things are slow. So let's say I'm talking with the bank, I sh that shouldn't be done with a regular web server. It will take several seconds. So what I do is, I save the, that job for later. If I want to do it later, I need to save it somewhere, so I need a queue. Um, so that's all, in, all the, in our case, almost everything will be a different task. Uh, extra benefits of doing this is fault isolation. If the bank is down, for example, and cannot process authorizations or settlements, because it's a deferred task, it doesn't matter. The customers will still be able to donate. They, they, they won't know if it's approved or not, but they will get the thank you page. And they, they might even get an email, say thank you for the donation. And we'll tell them later if it was approved or not. The other advantage is increased reliability. If for some reason something failed on the authorization, for example, I have all the information saved and I can rerun it. In, um, in our case, the deferred batch system, I put that there because it, it, it was a big gain for us. We decided that the contribution was going to be paid, was going to be realized at the authorization point. Although we hadn't the money yet, because we haven't done the settlement, we're going to consider that paid right away. If we do that, we can do the settlement, we do it deferred always, but we can do it in batches instead of having one settlement per post, we can send one post with 400 settlements. Big gain. This is how a QU system looks. On the right, I have the processes doing the work. They, call, they are called workers. Authorization, settlements, sending email. I have the queue in the middle where I save the jobs. On the left, I have the web servers putting the jobs in the queues. We use Sidekick. And we have two blocks. This is how you use Sidekick. We have two blocks. One is you define a class for the worker. In this case, we're doing the settlements. And you have to define a method called perform. And the settlement.find uh, will get an idea of the model settlement. And the, the method that will talk to the bank is settle exclamation point. So that first block is who is doing the job. And the second, the, the, the line that's uh, in the middle, it's how to put it in the queue. I use the perform async method, which is a method with, uh, by Sidekick. And I give, it the, I give the ID of the settlement of the record. I put it in the queue, the other one will process. 
Rails 4.2 has Active Job incorporated, and you can Active Mailer has has it integrated out of the box. So you want to send an email asynchronously, you say deliver later. A line at the at the bottom. Very simple. If uh, if you're doing different tasks, you have some costs. The queuing systems are unreliable, except Sidekick. <laughs> That's because Mike, who wrote Sidekick, was around. So <laughs> just in case. Uh, but but it, it's not that. It, a job can die. A, the computer can die. The bank can have a problem. Or a, the communication gets disconnected. All those things. And you're having a different task. The job, the job didn't run. What are you going to do? Sidekick will do retries automatically. But maybe you run it all the time. All the times are used. You're supposed to retry and it never succeeded. What do you do? If it's a settlement, let's say a $100 settlement, and you never settle, you're going to lose that money because you didn't transfer. Um, what else? Coordination. You cannot do authorizations after do, doing settlements. That will fail. And it's difficult to debug things. It's kind of crazy because things happen anytime, and because we have multiple hosts, it, they happen anywhere. You remember I told you about the logs? This is where they are important. You, that's the only way to know what happened. Great, we're doing great. That's the last one where we have covered everything, but the last one. Uh, scalable architecture. This is the most important one. And I put it at the end because I am a developer. And as developers, we always overlook architecture. But it, it shouldn't be like that. The idea is when I'm writing software, I have to be thinking it has to be fast. I'm sure all of you write fast, fast software, but that's not enough. You also have to think how I am going to scale this in the future. And um, if, you don't, if you don't think this way, you might make mistake, and it's going to be difficult to fix because you have a whole system written that way. Uh, so I'm going to give you two examples. Let's say that uh, you saw the, the first contribution form. I have these amounts. So I might say, hey, I would like to have a process that on the fly will calculate what are the best amounts to show depending on the organization and depending on the user. Uh, so I can say, oh, okay, let's start de developing this. And I, I'm going to use machine learning. Oh, great. And right away, I say, you know what? If we have a central system to do this, it would be great. If things will be easy. Oh, great. We do it that way. Well, that doesn't scale. At some point, I will, want to, I will have so much load on this system, I will want to have two of these, and I can't, because it, it, there is a central one, so I don't, cannot have two. There is another example, the uh, deferred, uh, excuse me, the batches for the settlements. We decided it was a decision. It's a architecture, architectural decision. We are going to consider the payment, the contribution processed at the authorization, at the end of the authorization. And that is huge, because I don't need to do the other part, I can say right away, after that step, I can say, hey, we're done. And that's the list, scalable architecture at the top. And that's all I have. If uh, you are interested in what we do, uh, come talk to, to us. We have stickers also somewhere there. Uh, th those are my colleagues, by the way. Um, but we have, we have time, we have, yeah, seven, seven minutes or six minutes for questions. Anyone has? Okay. The question is, when you have multiple servers, how do you handle the logs? You will have many computers generating them. We use paper trail, and it works very well. And with paper trail, you, you define, you have to, the, or the, 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 the systems generating the log will connect with their system and through a web interface, you see everything in a single page. You can filter if you want, of course. But that, that, that's the way to go. Okay. Uh, we have, we, we, we could do that. We, we don't do it on purpose. We don't have a system to simulate load. Ah, excuse me, the question was, 
how do we simulate load or how do we prepare for the future record like, like this one? And we don't, we, don't do it, we don't do it on purpose because we, we have something called recurring contributions. Every day at four in the morning we run, a, you can define, I, I, want, I make this contribution and I, can, I want to make it every month or I want to make it every week. So we have lots of them and at four in the morning we run them all together and that's a lab in itself. So it's pretty close to reality and we can, we can analyze uh, there how, how the system is handling. In fact, in some cases, the bank cannot handle the load because, because it's, it's all in one single time. Uh, we, can, we can do it very close. We have to gauge it, throttle. We have to throttle it and make it a little spread. Also, we have the end of quarter. On every end of quarter, the organizations have goals and they all push at, at the, at, until midnight. After midnight, all the traffic will go down. So we also uh, use that. So basically, we don't do our own simulation, but we are very careful to study those cases. Another question? Great. Thank you so much. <laughs>